First time. You're new here, Lord. Someday, somewhere, I'll make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching this show, Babylon 5, for the very first time. And in this show, we are applying that over-analytical lens that we've acquired as Star Trek podcasters to this show, trying to see what kind of messages exist within this show and trying to just figure out how much we lament not watching the show sooner. And while this is not a podcast about Star Trek, we are sure to pull those references in because honestly, how, how could we not? But to help us with that, we've decided to limit ourselves and play the, the game we call the rule of three. That means each one of us gets up to Three references to Star Trek per episode, and that's it. Three. One of those three. No substitutions, exchanges, or refund. <laughs> hey, Brent. Hey, Jeff. We have a five star review. Oh, yes. This one is on Audible, and it's from Ooh. Adam. We're on Audible. We always freak out when we get something through Audible. What's up, Adam? And Audible. Adam says, great for B5 vets and newbies. Jeff and Brent have been methodically covering one episode per week since mid-2022. I love the perspective they bring as Star Trek experts who missed the show's original run. Their predictions, right and wrong, are great fun. I'm really impressed by their discipline in avoiding spoilers. If you're new to Babylon 5, this is a great podcast to follow along with because they will not spoil anything. But if you're already a Babylon 5 fan, It is thrilling to relive the joy of watching the show for the first time through them. Adam, I have no idea what it is to be a uh, Babylon 5 veteran watcher because I'm not that. But I love that you love that people get to watch this along with us for the very first time. And it's Jeff and I's biggest hope that you guys out there who have watched Babylon 5 before, which is the vast majority of our audience, are getting to relive those days when you watched it for the first time. And you know what's wild? We've been doing, like, if it's not this week, it's next week is our one-year anniversary. Really? Yeah, oh, my gosh. This, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, it was like Memorial Day last year. Oh, my started. God. No, that's, like, like, now. Yeah, but I don't know. The days change, right? Yeah, that's you know? true. That's so, true. yeah, yeah. Like, it's. That's great. It's been a year, Jeff. A year. A year. Wow. And we're just about, like, we're, we're just, I mean, I, I feel like we're getting to the story. Right. You know, yeah, we're we're just we're we're just into it right now is what it feels like. Yeah. Well, hey, let's not get off this train. Brent, we have another five star review. Yes. This one is off of Apple Podcasts, and Keigel says, Love these first time viewing shows, and I'm glad there's such a good one for B5. Huh. I kind of miss B5. Mm -hmm. Well, Keigel. Here's the good news. You can relive it with us right here on this show, and uh, you can go through it. You can watch the episodes with us. Jeff, you know one of the the big fears that I have for folks out there? Yeah. Because I know I've been in, in this shoe as a, as a um, listener before. It's really easy to get into a show like this and be like, okay, I'm going to watch along with them. I'm going to watch this episode, and then I'm going to listen to their show, and then I'm going to watch the episode, and I'm going to listen to their show. And Life happens and you miss the episode, or maybe it's just an episode you didn't really care for very much. And so you don't, and then you miss Like you put off listening to the podcast because you haven't watched the episode this week. And then the next thing you know, the next week comes by and you don't have time to like go back and rewatch both of them. And so you get out of sync with the show and all of a sudden it piles up and it, and it backs up and then you wind up falling away from the show because you're trying to keep up with it. Because you've added on this other thing. You know what the great thing is? In every single one of these episodes, we'll give you guys a recap as far as what happened in the show. So if you are watching along and you find yourself getting out of sorts and you find yourself getting behind, just jump in 
because we'll remind you exactly what happened in the episode. Don't fall behind and stay with us. That's the easy way to do it. Don't fall behind. But you're right. If you do, do. Don't feel that pressure. That pressure is the worst. That's self-imposed. Yeah. We'll be here for you week after week. You're putting that week. on yourself. Fine. Yeah. We're not putting that on you. You're putting that on yourself. Uh, Jeff, you know what? We like to play another game. Now, this game usually happens at the end of the episode where we take a look at the next week's episode. All that we've seen is the title. We've never seen anything beyond that point. We only see the title. We make a guess as far as what that episode is going to be about. This is the point where it's time to pay the piper. It's time to look back at last week's prediction about this week's episode and see just how close we were. So, Jeff, do you remember what you said Exogenesis was going to be about and how close were you? I sure do. Exogenesis I was talking about is the theory that life on Earth actually originated somewhere else and made its way to Earth over time. So I thought we were going to get a First Ones recruitment mission and we were going to learn about the First Ones and the Vorlons interactions with like early, early humanity. Could not possibly like that. It's like uh, there's some old uh, stuff. You might be a little closer than you think. Yeah, a little older stuff going on there, but yeah. not necessarily, not necessarily their um, their inclusion as angels and gods in, in humanity's past. What about you? What did you guess? So ultimately, I said this was going to be the origin story of the shadows, or at least like their buggy ships. And I said that because the word exogenesis made me think of the word exoskeleton and exoskeletons exist on bugs. I got bugs. You did. I nailed bugs. But as far as the origin story of the shadows, that absolutely did not happen. However, the whole point of these bugs is to be able to tell people about what has happened throughout all of this past. So maybe I didn't get the origin story of the shadows, but I got the origin story of the people who are going to give us the origin story of the shadows. So I'm going to at least take a half a point on that one. Yeah. And I say I get a point and a half because I got bugs and I got origin stories of origin stories and they're way back. Cause I do think this is a, like, are these bugs? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. Like, how, what are they exactly? We'll, we'll talk about that. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago, I was just talking uh, and saying, Hey guys, listen, if you, didn't get a chance to watch the episode. We're going to tell you what the episode was about. And Jeff, this week, it's on you, my friend. Why don't you let us know, let the folks out there know, maybe people who uh, haven't seen this episode in a while, or maybe they're watching along with us and they just missed this week's episode, or maybe they've never seen the show at all and they're just listening to our show anyway. Tell the folks out there what Exogenesis really was about. Well, hey, it's promotion time. The bartender at Earhart's announces that everyone's second favorite background character in the CNC behind season one, the jump gate is activating, lady. David Corwin is getting a promotion to full lieutenant. Hooray! Everyone is there to celebrate, except for Marcus, because Ivanova didn't think that having him there would be a very good idea. And speaking of not very good ideas, Sheridan is worried that with his promotion, Corwin could expose the pro-anti-Earth movement that he's kind of pulled together through General Haig. Huh. Well, I guess I guess that means that in Babylon 5, ranks actually define your level of responsibility in your job. Wow, weird. I'm not used to that in sci-fi. Well, Sheridan asks Ivanova to feel this guy out and see if he's going to be a problem or not. And we have a Marcus sighting. He's hanging out and down below making friendly with the shopkeepers and showing us all how well read he is. Even cool old dude Duncan is a little tired of Marcus quoting Mc, but I mean, sorry, the Scottish play still Marcus is making nice with the people getting updates from his contacts and, you know, doing Ranger stuff that Rangers do down below. One of his contacts says the Rangers have been ordered away from earth by Ranger one because of the mess there. And another one of his contacts has stopped showing up to work altogether. Apparently, he has more important things to do. I wonder if those important things have anything to do with the dead dude laying in med lab. Franklin is doing an autopsy on this guy that's been living in Down Below for a few years. He had some trace drugs in his system. Probably one of the guys got some of the dust from last week's episode. And a weird kind of sort of 
parasitic life form has wrapped around and entwined itself around his spine. Well, Marcus's buddy, the old shopkeep, Duncan, is missing. And after striking out with Garibaldi, he gets Dr. Franklin to help him out by using a masterful, masterful execution of the English language. They end up, down below, captured by a group of lurkers, including Marcus's old contact that said he had more important things to do. They have Duncan and some other dude laying on the ground, recovering from the trill joining ceremony. <laughs> Turns out that the thing wrapped around dead dude's spine is a life form called the Vendrizi. Medlab guy died in the joining because of the drugs in his system. Franklin and Marcus are completely freaking out. These parasites are controlling the people, and they suspect a conspiracy. <laughs> but the one in Duncan is failing too, probably because of his poor health. They get Franklin to doctor him, and Marcus uses that as an opportunity to escape. Ready to kick some lurker butt, the main Vendrizi dude and Duncan explain that the people, the hosts, volunteered to be joined. The aliens have a mission spanning half a million years to collect and store the history of the galaxy, saving it for, through the coming dark ages. They've seen things that no one could even imagine. And to prove that it's voluntary and the Vendrizi are cool after he's healthy, Duncan has his symbiont removed from him. Franklin agrees this is a noble mission and then agrees to help them, but only after he can analyze the Vendrizi and talk to the volunteer hosts. They're totally cool with that. In CNC, Ivanova asks Corwin to come to her quarters to discuss his future. He's a little confused, thinking that she might be asking him out for a date. But he also isn't sure, but he doesn't want to be wrong either. So he buys some expensive synthetic roses and goes to meet her. Immediately, it is clearly not a date. And he plays off the roses as something he found lying outside her door. She asks him, like, I don't know, like two questions, and he answers the way any dutiful soldier would initially respond to their superior officer. So she writes him off as not being cool with the pro-anti-Earth group. Marcus sees Duncan to his ship. He's taking him out to explore the galaxy. He's got a renewed lease on life. He wants to experience some of the amazing things that he saw with the alien inside of him. Marcus is going to miss him but he wishes him well. Franklin is hanging out with our crew and hints to Ivanova. Marcus doesn't just like her, but he thinks he likes her, likes her. Infuriated, she finds him at a bar in what looks like the spot that Veer and Lanier used to meet all the time. She blasts the roses onto the bar next to him, leaving him with the impression that she's saying there's a chance. So Brent, what were your initial reactions to exogenesis yeah this episode was conspiracy from tng right 100 percent. like that's that's exactly what this was um no here i'm gonna jump all the way down to the end of my notes this is what i said this episode is what that episode infection from season one should have been oh wow okay is this a great episode probably not i think i think when we come down to the end of our rankings this will probably find itself in the lower half maybe upper part of lower half. Cause I didn't think it was a bad episode. I was, I was um, intrigued. I was grossed out in some of the, in, with some of the, the effects in the scenes, particularly dealing with the bugs. But um, Jeff, th this isn't going to make any sense to you, but I was like, are the, first of all, I was like, okay, so these guys are the guys from conspiracy and TNG. Oh wait, maybe they're the Gould. Oh wait, maybe they're Tokra from stargate sg1 and then i was like oh, did stargate steal its people its whole idea from babylon 5 like ds9 supposedly did like like i was i was like whoa what are these guys and at the end of the day i think that this is gonna be season three's geometry of shadows okay i think it'll be an episode that when we get further down the road i don't know that we need to get all the way to the end but just further down the road we'll understand this episode in a different light and things that happen in this episode, we'll see what it's foreshadowing and what it's what it's mean. We'll understand things in a different way as you come back and watch this episode later on. My fear is we're never going to see these bugs again because the whole thing is there's there like they said it. We're the ones who are going to tell you what's what. 
you know, and I mean, these bugs are old, but they said they were created. So who created them? And there's, there's questions I think that we have coming out of this. My fear is these are going to be the next techno mages. We're just never going to see them again. I still think we're going to see them. I still, you still think hold- we're seeing the techno mages. I don't think so. There'll be the cavalry that comes in. I'm hoping. I, so. I hope. So. Hey, listen, if this is the end of the Avengers in game, when, you know, hey, on your left, and all of a sudden the holes open up and everybody we've seen for five seasons comes flooding through, awesome. I'll go watch it in a movie theater and get chills up and down my arms. I don't think it's going to happen. Jeff, Jeff. Jeff, what about you? What did you think of this episode, Exogenesis? Yeah, I thought it was an okay episode. You know, I mean, I, I liked it better on my first watch through than my second watch through. Like on my second one, I was just a lot of it was yeah. just like, yeah, okay, got it, got it. Yeah, get to the thing, get to the thing. But it was interesting. It was kind of cool. I liked seeing Marcus just do Ranger stuff. You know, we talked a, a little while ago about, like, what does Jakar do all day now that he's not an ambassador? And I think we had this idea of, like, what do the Rangers do? But we saw it. Like, they go talk to people, and they develop contacts, and they're doing espionage and being cool to people. But I, I think the aliens, like the Vendrizi, what a cool idea. I have that same question. Who created them? Why? And and how will they play into the future? I What I want to think is that we'll see them again at some point when there's like they hit a wall and then they have to get the history lesson, you know, they need the history lesson that's older than the Vorlons sort of a thing to go back and give them stuff. But no, it was fun. It was an okay episode that if it came up again, like, eh, I don't know if I'd really be into it. I think if anything, like two of my big takeaways out of it is Marcus is great. He's a fun character yeah. that I really enjoy. And I am a hundred percent convinced that he and Ivanova are totally going to hook up now. I will, I will say this. Um, I absolutely hope that Marcus and Ivanova turn into a, will they, won't they type ongoing joke, you know, like, yeah. like Ivanova's like, a, no, 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 I'm not interested in Marcus is chasing that Marcus is going to find him somebody. And then Ivanova is going to be like, actually, you know, he's not so bad. And she's going to go try to run off this other girl. And then she's going to, not be interested you know they're just gonna go it's it's a ross and rachel type thing right yeah. like it's gonna be that sort of a deal i i uh a lois and clark type like i just that's what kind of where i want to see this particular uh relationship go but i'm with you yeah i like the character duncan quite a bit and i thought it was cool just the just the idea that marcus marcus hangs out with these people you know yeah but marcus is supposed to be laying low and marcus seems to know everybody on the station <laughs> Well, I think that's the balance, right? There's the laying low is not being seen with Sheridan and with Ivanova and Garibaldi, even though he's literally arguing with Garibaldi in the open, like basically just, I'm working hard here to get contacts to fight this evil thing. And you're getting down, jumping down my throat. Come on. Right, right. But outside of that, like, I think his job is to know everybody and know everything that's going on. Well, speaking of knowing everybody and knowing everything that's going on, uh, Ranger One, aka that's one Jeffrey Sinclair, hundred percent, right? totally. Yeah, that's I like getting a Sinclair reference without getting a Sinclair reference like that. But you got to think about it too. How it's Sinclair, totally. He's Ranger One in there, but we haven't talked about how all this Earth stuff has got to be impacting him. He's still an official Earth representative on Minbar, is he though? I think so. We would have I mean, heard if otherwise. They canceled him. Do you think he's really going anywhere and changing anything that he's doing? Well, he would just he would just change whatever you know. Oh, Earth isn't paying for this apartment for me now. I'm going to go live in this one that the Rangers are paying for me to live in now. Like or the Mimbari are just going to let me stay here. It's okay. Yeah, it would just at most change his address. But I think I think you know when they said they're pulling them from Earth and Marcus is like, yeah, tell me something you know I don't know. Come on, dude. Mm-hmm. It's honestly a pretty big deal because the point of the Rangers is to be the eyes and ears of Sinclair, you know, of Ranger one doing stuff. And he's saying, no, it's too dangerous for me to even have eyes and ears there at this point. Stand by. We'll be right back. Are you ready to take your Babylon five for the first time experience to the next level with our exclusive Patreon? you'll get access to all kinds of cool stuff that you can only find there. Our recording notes, unedited reaction videos, an exclusive Discord community. And you can even be listed as a producer of the show. Plus, we even offer exclusive meet and greets and hangouts. You won't find this kind of experience anywhere else. 
Get all these amazing benefits, plus the opportunity to interact with other fans from around the world. It's being part of a huge community where everyone shares the same appreciation for Babylon 5. Subscribe at patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. That's the number five in the word first to get access to these incredible benefits. That's patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. We can't wait to see you there. So Marcus Dolly has a thing for Ivanova. Yeah. Ivanova throws these flowers in his face, thinking they're from him. It just says, keep them. Ivanova has got an issue with Marcus. And I think I know what it is. Okay. I think it's the fact that he pronounces her name. Ivanova. Ivanova. That's the, that's the worst. <laughs> that's people want to get us for an Ivanova way back then. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. She's like, let's no, that's not. I loved when she was taking those roses to him, though, and like it had like marching, like total army beat, and she's just beelining to it. You're like, she's not just gonna throw the roses at him; she's gonna stab him right in the face. Like, he is. (laughs) Yeah, she was furious with that, but she was hilarious. The whole rose thing was uh, Uh, well, the the whole asking dude out on a date, but she didn't. She didn't, but she did. And she had to have known what she was doing. Ivanova's not that stupid. But I think here's the thing. And I, and, and this is, this is a 2023 question of a 1996 episode right here. Okay. If that was Sheridan asking him to come to his quarters and talk about the, you know, his future and what he sees himself doing down the, down the road, would he have even made the assumption it was going to be a date? Like, how often do women in authority have to deal with this? Where it's like, hey, it's my job as your superior officer to help develop you and write like a development plan, you know, or whatever. Yeah, but here's the thing. If Sheridan had been the one to say it, let's assume that it's completely platonic. Sheridan would have broed him up when he's like, oh, so should we meet like for breakfast? No, 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 that's too private. Why don't you just come by my place and we'll hang out. We'll grab a couple of beers. We'll whatever and we'll just talk and just kind of get to know each other a little bit and that's it Um, unless he was actually hitting on him and then he would have hit on him but the way ivanova approached this and i get it this was written for a laugh it was portrayed but it was such a betrayal of who ivanova is as a character i i really while i smiled and chuckled at it i really hated it for her because it just it it she played this whole role like she was either an idiot or she was a genius because she was doing it on purpose, except she wasn't supposed to be doing it on purpose. The whole like, oh, where'd these flowers come from? Oh, well, gosh, these are just these are just ridiculous. Oh, synthetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, but it is romantic and I do love it. And, I'm, you know, like she's just. Yeah, it was it was not a good look for her. I think everything leading up to them being together in, the, in their quarters was not a good look for her. She knows better. She She's a commander. She has had people reporting to her in the past. She should know how to do this. And then when they're sitting down having the coffee, right, that's great, awesome, you know, get a little common ground. And then she she literally asks him, like, hey, if somebody, if somebody did something wrong, would you turn them in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then she's like, oh, well, shoot, you, you're, you're bad news then. What in God's name was he supposed to say? Like, right. first off, he's like, great pivot on his part where he's like, oh, this is not a date. Okay. No, I don't, I don't know what these are. Just, I mean, smooth as silk. Right. Right. I love too with the florist where he's like, if it is a date, I don't want to screw it up. Like, this is awesome. But if it's not a date, that's cool too. I don't want to look like an idiot. <laughs> like, well, that, that florist was like, the only time flowers aren't appreciated is when you don't get them. And I was like, this dude is a salesman. Oh, my gosh. He's so good at his job. Yeah, it was awesome. He's also, Corwin is like 16 feet taller than that florist. Right. That was weird. But but so, you know, it makes he's he's on it. He's pivoting. He's paying attention to every nuance of what's going on. He knows what's, you know, I mean, this is a big deal. The commander having you in for coffee. And then she literally asks him two questions that he answers exactly as he should have. And then she's like, mm, nope, we're not that was not a good look for her either. Like she should have been able to. It's not a good look. Yeah. No. Where this where this really needed to go, and we to be fair, we have. Well, I guess we did. This needed to be a group setting. Hey, you who just got a promotion, come hang out. Come hang out at our poker game. 
come hang out at dinner that the captain is making in his quarters with the whole command staff. Like, let's put you in this. Situ- I need to buzz on that because I totally, you might even give me two because it was two different references. But also they're, they're, they're references, but they're also just literally good, like good leadership and group yeah. dynamic things to do. So yeah, those are straight from Star Trek, but also. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, but that's what you do. It, it, it gets into a group situation. You invite them into the group and Sheridan needs to be the one really feeling that out. But I get, I get it. He's trying to give Ivanova this. Uh, this is a B plot. They're trying to write something that's funny. Ha ha ha. Um, I get it. I just did not appreciate it for Ivanova. What what she has brought to that role. Like I, I think it was a dumbing down of Ivanova. It really was. Uh, and and I I hated that. But it was it was funny. It got played for laughs. Yeah, it was funny. I think it short sold her. I think it short sold Corwin as well. Yeah. I mean, God, he could be the perfect guy. But there's yeah, it's just. Wasn't well done, but if if the whole point was to get a laugh and to introduce us to Corwin, mission accomplished. Sure, sure. You know the one person you can't invite to that dinner, though, is Ensign Kim, because he'd be pissed. What do you mean he's a lieutenant? How does what do you that mean he got a promotion? God! And his job's changing? Like, Or what? even Tom Paris. Hey, I'm an ensign, I'm a lieutenant. doesn't matter. I got the same job, and we don't have money, so it doesn't even make a difference. But hey, you know what? We got an answer to a question that we raised just last week, Jeff. What would happen if everybody's off station? Who takes command? And you correctly said, well, there's that one dude who gets a couple lines every once in a while. Turns out it's him. That's the one. When Sheridan and Ivana would go off to talk about him, he she's like, hey, you've got it, man. And it was really cool. Like the camera stayed there for like two seconds of him just like in front of the controls of just like, yeah, I can do this now. And I think it was. I I didn't realize he was a lieutenant junior grade. Well, now I know. Now he's lieutenant. Is, is that command level? I don't know. Who knows? But well, he he's can not run lieutenant CNC. commander, but he can still, you know, take the con, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay, can we talk about Franklin? I suppose. Can we talk about how much of a nerd Franklin is? Like an utter nerd. Now, I don't know if biology was supposed to be a euphemism for the word sex. I don't think so. I don't don't think it was. I think it was everything comes down to biology or math. (laughs) It's like, shut up. Like, I don't want you at this table. Leave. Go to another table. I'll even show you my PhD. I brought it with me. I've got it right here. I got a PhD and an MD. I'm a double. Call me Dr. Doctor. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Franklin. One in math, one in in medical biology. It's what I can do. He's just, he's such a nerd. Although, he got my biggest laugh out of the whole episode uh it's during the autopsy which i'm sorry did you also notice this he has the gloves on when he's cut into the dude yeah and he's got blood all over his gloves right and then he picks up this pristine clear plastic thing to put the thingy in none of that blood transfers to the plastic thingy at all you know i just i it's makeup it it is what it is but nothing transferred to the, the plastic thing but my favorite moment, and this is, I don't know why this is so stupid. The, the corpse is laying there on the table like this, and he's hes just going through. He's touching. He's looking at him, and as he's, like, pulling back, he shuts the corpse's eyes. Oh, really? Yeah, he, he does. That. He just, bloop. <laughs> and he just keeps, and he just moves on with his deal. I don't know why that struck me as so funny, but, like, I'm even sitting there thinking about the actor who is playing that corpse who's laying there has got to have his eyes open. Like this is a moment of direction where he's like, okay, he's going <laughs> to, he's going to close your eyes. Like, oh, I guess just, I can do this now. It was, it was just a good little chuckle. I was like, that's ridiculous. If I, and probably nobody out there is there. Everybody out there is listening. Like why shut up, Brent. I never caught that. My laugh with him was when uh, they were locked up and Marcus was asking about Ivanova and he's just like, are, are you serious right now? <laughs> like, right. There's dudes out there with guns and you're asking me about Ivanova. You're going to, we're going to talk about this. Yeah. Because Marcus is awesome and he doesn't care about the guys with guns. He'll take care of them. He needs some help with his love life. Exactly. This is not a big, uh, that whole thing where he's like, there's three guys with guns out there. What are we going to do? And Marcus is like, yeah, we get rid of one of them. And then there's only one guy with a gun. It's not my math. Well, I come from a much more interesting place than you do. Although was it, was this the scene that Marcus, cause he was trailing Dr. Franklin where he 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 brought in the Christmas Carol Bob uh, uh, Jacob Marley reference. He did that with Garibaldi when he was. Oh, that's trying Garibaldi. To get, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, I I like that one. No, actually, I no. I'm sorry. My biggest laugh. I have to take that back. 
was Marcus talking about Duncan? Duncan. Yeah, the shopkeeper guy. He he said, or maybe it was somebody else. He and he goes, something's gotten into him. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> ah, ah, yeah, I did, didn't it? I see what you did there. I right? see that. But don't, um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Richard Biggs. Richard Biggs was great in this episode. Like Franklin, Franklin was okay. I think I think Franklin showed us he's a competent doctor in this episode. But Richard Biggs was great. I think really every time he's doctored, like there was that uh and now for a word when he was like did a one or shot of him doing triage and telling people what's going on, and he's just nailing it. And that autopsy, like he's rattling all the stuff off, just pulling dude's eyes shut like you said super smooth he's he gets a lot of those real quiet things that that just really make him legit yeah i listen i didn't hate franklin in this episode yeah yeah that's fair you know he he was fine i i did find um and this might have been more of the direction yeah you know from the director uh when the computer is going through and like finds the anomaly and like it starts listing off and he goes hold up what was the anomaly i'm like no 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 that you catch that the first time it says that and you're like show you don't, you shouldn't have to tell the computer to show you the anomaly it just goes no this is fine this is fine one anomaly detected boom here it is yeah because it was just going to keep going i feel like babylon 5 has the worst computers ever because especially when he's like yeah we're going to analyze this sample and then marcus comes in he's like hey garibaldi said i should talk to you about this <laughs> let's let's go his interest is so indescribable but the point where he's like, yeah, just take an hour. Just take an hour to go look at this. And he's like, well, the computers will take at least that long. What? <laughs> like, what kind of machines are you running? This is 96. There were Pentiums at this point. Like, come on. So Garibaldi had one of those scenes in this episode where he's talking on the monitor. Mm-hmm. Jeff, I, I, these, these scenes have not gotten any better since season one. Like, the one ride that I'm specifically reminded of is the Fast and the Furious ride at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. They have the movie stars up on the screen talking to the guy, the physical person who's right there at the ride. And it's, you know, they've timed it out what they're saying so that they can feel like they're talking back and forth to each other. Mm-hmm. But it's so like, it's just off and it's clearly made that way. That's what every single one of these video calls feels like to me. I want to know, like, from the technical standpoint, how Star Trek does these video calls compared to how Babylon 5 does them. Because it's yeah. a night and day difference. And and not even, like, modern, like all the way back to the original series through all of Star Trek, when they're talking on a screen to somebody, it feels it feels very real. They feel like, it, well, I mean, it feels like you and me. Yeah, like right now. Right here. It makes sense. Babylon 5, 100% of the time. It's dude in front of an old handy cam with a VHS tape stuck inside of it, recording his lines and then them playing back and hoping that they can time it like due to the fast and furious, ride. It's not, it is not well done. Right. I liked Marcus though. Like, you know, he, he and Franklin together weren't a bad couple, but Marcus through the whole thing, kind of like you said, um, quoted the Dickens stuff, you know, to Garibaldi. And then he's quoting Shakespeare to Duncan. And I feel like a big part of what we were supposed to get out of this is like Marcus is a very he's very academic. He's very well read, but he's also mm-hmm. cool. Whereas you got Franklin who's super academic and super smart, but he's just a jerk and a nerd. But you put them together, they're not a bad duo. Like they worked pretty well together. Sure. Yeah, I I thought I, I was no, I I mean, yeah, they can they can play off each other just fine. Just fine. You know, you know who I haven't seen together in a while and i really want to see them like just playing off each other is garibaldi and ivanova remember when they used to just like cut on each other in those first yeah. bunch of episodes way back in season one you were convinced that they were gonna hook up like they yeah. were yeah yeah because but they were like they were like brother and sister the way they were poking at each other and that's not been the case i mean really for two and a half seasons at this point jeff and i want it back because i liked those two together yeah we get the Sheridan Ivanova Garibaldi triangle sometimes, but yeah, we don't get the the we get the Sheridan Ivanova pair off. Yeah, we get the Sheridan Garibaldi pair off, but yeah, we're totally missing that one. Right. With the the last note I have on my stuff with Marcus was when he was doing his business with the, his contacts. There were the two notes, right? Rangers leaving Earth, and then the shadows building a border 
along Centauri space. Yeah. Now, is this something? I mean, this was what Morden and um, uh, Londo were talking about when they kind of severed relations, right? That's uh, yeah, because he kind of drew that line in, yeah. on his on his PowerPoint presentation. It's like you get this, we get this, but it 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 really strikes me that they're building a border there of ships. Like, is this a defensive posture, or are they getting ready to launch on the Centauri, or is it totally unrelated, and they're just having to build up of forces? What also gets me is the idea that how are people seeing the shadows build up a force along the border, right? Like, because that means that we have to know who you are and that we have to be able to recognize you and that this is not being done in secret, but we're seeing what you're doing. Well, I think that's the, I think that's what the Rangers do. Like the Rangers understand what the shadows are. They've got a little more insight. They can see some of that. So they're out patrolling and they see these things maybe. But what's the border? So if the shadows are supposed to be secret, nobody really knows that they're that they're out there, right? Like that that was the whole thing with the lens. It was like, oh, we can't let them know that we're here yet. That we know that they're there yet. Well, what is their space? What is the border? You know, like if this is the edge of Centauri space, should they know that that's the edge of Centauri space? Like, th- should everybody else realize that's the edge? Because isn't this deal just between Centauri and the shadows? Yeah, but I also think that well, yeah, because I mean, what is the shadow space? Like, what is that? Right. Unless the Rangers have a copy of the PowerPoint, you know, that shows shows the border. I mean, maybe that's just the outer rim. Like there's Centauri, the border that they've declared. That's the thing that a lot of sci-fi kind of has that gets really weird is when they start talking about borders. You know, oh, we're we're heading into such and such space, or this is the neutral zone between our our you know places. I think we've talked a little bit about geography and space and how like, I, I don't understand it. It's three dimensional. It's all weird. That's why you get a quadrant 37. Cause it's a, it's volume and not a, not a graph paper thing. Like, okay, cool. Got it. But yeah. How do you track a border and how do you, yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you do that? And then how do they, yeah. How do they amass a border without people noticing them? Even if it is the Centauri, Right, because some Centauri know Londo knows who they are. Lord Rifa knows who they are because they've been Morden's been dealing with him. But what about just like I'm Centauri Alpha Pilot One out on patrol? There's some some freaking huge black ships over here. Should somebody be concerned? Holy crud! So let's talk about the bugs. So here's what we've got: the bugs are over half a. Did he say billion or million? I got million five hundred thousand years old. Okay. So they're over half a million years old and they were created by whom, Jeff, by whom to record and carry the memories of all of history so that when the universe plunges itself into another dark age, the people can return to these guys and be taught what they've already learned and remember what they've already learned. And they say that when that comes, you guys are going to come and we're going to be here to tell you this. But in order to do so, They've got to go between their parasites. That they got to go between host to host to host uh, to to live. But the hosts are supposedly willing to take this on, and it's a pretty sweet deal. They get life, health, knowledge, and they get a full time friend to share their body with. Yeah, what's the problem? Is that's pretty much it, right? Like that's that's what we got. It seems great, you know. And I think and I think Franklin saw that at the end, you know, and he's like, "Cool, I'm good with this. I want to." I want to examine you. I want to get statements from the volunteers. Like I want to vet this, but it's cool. But it also, and we don't have enough of the story to know anything about this, but why didn't they walk in, go to captain Sheridan and say, hi, we're emissaries from this group that does this thing. And here's how our stuff, like why hide it and try and sneak around? Maybe right. that's part of what they do. I don't know. They were straight up evil, bad conspiracy aliens all the way up until the point they got Franklin to start working on. I think it was Duncan who was, you know, not doing well with uh, with the parasite, with the with the Vendrizi in it. As soon as they got D- Duncan working on it, and then Marcus came in, then they're like, "Hey, so actually, it's totally cool. Like we're doing this awesome thing. Everybody here's a willing part. Like, why didn't they lead with that? Right." I, I also found interesting that so they said that they do die over time, and that's why they got to jump from host to host. Like that kind of reinvigorates them. And according to Franklin, they can exist in any life form, right? So it's not just that they need humans or anything. I missed so, that one. I missed that part. 
Okay. During the uh, during the autopsy, he says they're 100 percent neuro neurologically neutral and can exist within any life form. And then he says this doesn't line up with any parasite that we've ever ever studied before. And I wondered too because when he pulled like the spiny thing, the little wiggly thing off of the dead guy's spine, it started moving and activating. Yeah. And so I was like, is that alien dead? Can they kind of regenerate or respawn? Are the memories stored there? I have a lot of really technical questions about these Vendrizi, and I, which is a big reason why I hope we see them again. Like I want to understand, I want to know who made them and why. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about the dark ages, are they talking about our coming shadow war? Is that, is that, did they know half a million years ago that this was coming? And how did they know that? Well, I mean, I th I, that's the idea. That's the MO of the shadows is they keep trying to come back. And because they've never actually been destroyed, they've just been halted. As soon as they like regather their forces and regather their strength, they're back again. And, you know, you know that they're going to keep coming back until somebody actually defeats them. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that's how they figure out how to defeat the, the how to actually defeat the shadows is okay so tell us what people have done before in the past okay so let's learn from everybody else and try to figure out how to beat them now like beat them beat them it really is that difference between um tribal knowledge you know where they tell the story over and because that's like that's what kosh is going to bring that's what delen is going to bring the stories that have been told time and again they're bringing the actual observations like they've got the real lived experiences yeah first hand so accounts here right exactly that's why i think we will see them again at some point where like they share it in or somebody's like we need to know like this isn't working we're losing we need one last effort and it has to count franklin remember those dudes there's those dudes they know everything reach out to them i can see that's that's where they come back i hope they come back i don't think they will but i hope they do like i'm, I'm with you i really want them to i just i feel like they're going to be a one and done. We're not going to see them again. Like the, the, the lasting things in this episode were the two pieces dropped by the Ranger, right? That the Rangers are leaving earth and the shadows are building up a border. Like those are the carry on things. And then there'll be the Ivanova and Marcus stuff a little bit, but so these guys are a thing. They are. I, and that's what I kind of got out of this episode as a whole, Jeff. Same. And I okay, think so. these guys are a thing. Yeah. Here they are. Awesome. You know? We got you guys, we got techno mages, we got soul hunters, we got these things yeah, that are out see there. Soul hunters again. Don't you shut your mouth. We don't <laughs> want to see them again. <laughs> don't even speak them into existence. <laughs> be fine, never seen them. But I don't know about you, Brent, but I think it's we've reached that part of the show where it's time to boil this all down, see if the show has any of that Star Trek -y quality to it. Maybe it has a deep moral message, or it's holding up a mirror to society or giving us hope. That will be better in the future somehow. We're going to do this by me rating the episode on a scale of zero to five deltas as to how Star Trek y it is with the message. And Brent, you're going to rate this one on a scale of zero to five star theories as to how much we enjoyed the episode and just how Babylon 5 it is. And I'll go ahead and go first on the deltas. And I think this one, there was one line. That uh, the dude said, the guy who used uh, Samuel, who used to work with Marcus, he said one line, but it honestly pervades the entire episode. And he talks about why the lurkers are volunteering. Marcus is telling him that he gave Samuel a purpose. Why are you leaving to go do this other thing? And Samuel says, it's because your purpose comes from the outside to fight other people's battles. Mine, ours, our purpose comes from within. It comes from inside me. So here we go again. Like with Jeff, it's always going to turn into a conversation with that be, do, have kind of a piece. It's such an intrinsic message in Star Trek. And I think, honestly, it's even more of a message now in Babylon 5 through what we've seen. But yeah. in the be, do, have model, you change you to change the things around you or your experience around you. And it's the same thing when you look for an external motivation, whether it be possessions or a claim or whatever you're never going to reach true happiness you're never really going to be fulfilled duncan when he was running his little shop like he was looking for something external he has a purpose outside of himself and and franklin or marcus even brought that up you know don't you love the negotiation you know the 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 back and forth of everything ultimately duncan was going through the motions seeking something he could never get his health was failing he was depressed. He was about to give up. 
But once he found an internal motivation, he found something inside of himself that mattered, then he felt special. He says that, I want to feel special. He has, he was reinvigorated. He's out exploring the universe now. I honestly wish, like if I could look everyone in the eye through the Babylon 5 for the first time, through my Star Trek podcast, the Starfleet Leadership Academy, there's one message that I want you to hear and I want you to understand. Focus on you. Focus on what is inside of you and build those things and focus on the things that matter to you. That's the only way you're going to be fulfilled. It's the only way you're going to find happiness. When you're waiting on something outside of you or you're trying to find that grail out there, that unknown, that unreachable something, you're in for a life of disappointment. And that was the message to this one. Find something within. That's why the lurkers were volunteering to step forward. Ultimately, I'm going to give this one three deltas because I love the message. It was carried out through a good chunk of the episode, but it wasn't the in-your-face message in any way um, of it. But I think it was a really strong message and one that I'm very passionate about. I think you might be giving it a few more deltas than I would personally give it. I love what you're saying, though, because I did not pull that out. Like, it, it, that's a very intriguing concept. I didn't catch that one at all. Uh, so I love it. I don't know that I would give it that many, but I'm not doing deltas. You're doing deltas. I, however, I'm doing star. Fury. You got star furies. I got star furies. And this is how Babylon five is the episode. How much did we enjoy the episode? How much did it do it in Babylon five's own way? Jeff, the very first thing that you and I both basically said about this episode is it's Babylon five does conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So did it really do it in its own way? How much did we enjoy this episode? It's fine. It's okay. It's a Midland episode. Overall, I, I did enjoy the episode. I didn't hate it. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't get to the end of it and go, this was a complete, complete piece of garbage, trash episode. I'll be very interested when this episode airs uh, this week to see what people out there are saying about this episode. Like, are we going to get the, oh, just wait till next week, guys. It, it gets better. Like, or, or, oh, yeah. Not every episode's a good one. Not everyone's a banger. Or you missed everything. This is the whole show. You're an idiot. How could you think this? Oh, you got all the foreshadowing and everything. And I'm like, oh, God, please stop. But uh, I, I don't think it's a great episode. I think it's fine. You know, I, listen, you got to, there's there's worse ways to spend 22 hours of TV and right. fill in 22 hours of TV. We saw a lot of worse ways in seasons one and two. So um, true. Yeah. Uh, if this was a season two episode, Jeff. I think this would find it probably right. Yeah, probably just outside the top 10. Yeah, middle third-ish right in there. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know that it's going to wind up that high out of this season because I think the season's going to wind up being much better. But uh, that being said, I'm going to give this one two Star Furies. Okay. It was okay. It was just okay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. I totally agree with that. Not offensive in any way. Just okay. That um, uh, was an episode. We are putting together the definitive ranking of season three of Babylon 5. Our current top five, because we now have uh, more than five that we've gone through. Number one is Passing Through Gethsemane. And number two, Matters of Honor, Voices of Authority, Dust to Dust. And then at number five, A Day in the Strife. Brent, where do you rank Exogenesis? All right, Dust to Dust, we just did. Yes, last week. A Day in the Strife was Narns come to Babylon 5 to try to replace Jakar, and they have all of that going on. R remind me of Convictions. Which one was Convictions? That was a uh, bomber dude and Londo and Jakar in an elevator. Right. I loved Londo and Jakar in an elevator, but bomber dude was just... Um, I don't think this one's in the top five, Jeff. The only question is, is it above or below Convictions? And there's a right answer here, just so you know, no pressure, but there is a right answer. Is there a right answer? I'm going to put it below convictions. That is the correct answer. Yeah. I'm going to put it below convictions. I, I really didn't want to just drop it and make it last because that makes it feel like, oh, I hated this episode. This is the, like the worst one. I, it's really not that. It just of the episodes so far, this actually probably is the worst, uh, not worse. That's not, that's right. It's not as good as the other episodes we've seen so far. Cause I feel like, in Convictions, yeah, it had a really weak primary plot in the whole thing, but that Londo and Jakar stuff was incredible. Like It was really, yeah. really good. 
this didn't have that. It had a mention of a major plot device going on. That was about it. Yeah, and this, I mean, this messed with my favorite character on the show. Dead or dirty as far as I'm concerned. It just did. Yeah, So not okay. But that's it for Exogenesis. We like to play a game. Brent referenced it at the beginning of the episode, but we look at the title of the next one. We don't look at anything else. And based on the title alone, we guess what it's going to be about. Next week is Messages from Earth. So knowing just the title, Brent, what do you think Messages from Earth is going to be about? I think Sheridan's getting recalled. Oh, this is the one. I think I think this is the one where we get to the uh, you and I have been predicting Babylon 5 breaks away from from Earth Force, breaks away from Earth. This is that. This is the beginning of that. I don't know how many episodes it's going to take to play that out, but this is I think Sheridan is going to be pulled off cuz remember Chicky a couple from a couple episodes ago? Oh yeah. She's like, "Yeah, we're going to replace these people." And I think that's what this is. I think we're getting people coming out from Earth and uh sheridan's gonna get recalled and that's gonna accelerate everybody being like you know what screw you we're gonna go to go do our own thing and i i don't know why I've, like i feel so strongly that this is where we're going as a season and i can't explain why i think it's a natural progression i don't disagree with your theory at all on it and it it, 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 it feels like that right like i'm not which honestly like to go back it felt weird when Ivanova, when she was defending not inviting Marcus to Corwin's promotion party, and she's like, I don't see an EarthGov thing. That was that was a weird conversation. Yeah. Like all the way around. It was it was just Franklin was a nerd. Ivanova was Yeah. It look, it was my call. Why was it your call? Right? Yeah, the whole thing talking was about weird. inviting somebody out to a thing. It was my call. Uh, who wrote this episode? And just a couple just a couple episodes ago at the end of season two. Sheridan and Ivanova, here we are going back. I said we're done for it, but I think this is. But Sheridan and Ivanova talk about how they look at their uniform and they don't have the pride they had in it before. But now she's like, you don't have an earth like, let's, rest- let's restore that pride this year. Yeah. Is that, do you do that by excluding Marcus? No, I, I think I'm thinking on very similar lines. If, if things were a little bit different in this one, I would think that there would be a ship that came out towards kind of a weird anomaly in space. And through that, they got a bunch of messages from their family at Earth that they haven't seen in like six years. Uh-huh. And they, you know, they're looking at almost 70 more years before they get home to see them forever. And they read these messages and they get really excited because they think there's going to be a, oh wait, that was a different episode of Voyager where they got messages from <clears throat> sorry. No, I think of this one a pretty you close should just to you. buzz yourself for that just I don't because <laughs> I don't know if you have any left or not. <laughs> no. But seriously, it's messages from Earth. But I think um I don't think Sheridan's going to get recalled, but I think this is where the President Clark investigation stuff kind of comes to a head. I don't know that it'll be resolved, but it gets big. I think instead of recalling Sheridan, though, we're going to get Wells' chicky version three along with an entire contingent. They're going to put like an arm, an office of the Ministry of Peace on Babylon 5 and just completely... Now, Night Watch and Ministry of Peace are part of day-to-day operations in Babylon 5. I, I really hope we get either Wells or Chicky or both. Both would be great. I really, I want this, uh, I, I want this conflict. I absolutely want this conflict. Yeah, I think it'd be really good. And we're going to find out right here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you haven't already, please subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening to us or watching us. And if you could go by Apple Podcasts, Audible, Good Pods, Podchaser, leave us a review. I'll read it right here on the podcast. So until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. I got a favor to ask. Oh, yeah, of course. What, what do you need? So if you and I are ever out there in space for some reason together, I don't know. Maybe we're doing a podcast tour or something of that nature, right? And I get taken over by a parasitical bug. Will you kind of, you know, like take care of me, like help me go out and not be like that, please. What? Yeah. No, no, no. Seriously. Cause like, I hate bugs. And I, 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 I've seen this sci-fi show so many times where people get taken over and I, it's my wish to not live like that. So please don't let me go on like that. I've seen this before. Something of the host always survives. I don't No. I, I, Brent, I, I'm not going, I'm not killing you. I'm not going to do anything like that whatsoever. Hey, peace, victory, and long life. 
this my first time. Do any work. Yeah, we want no it work. to be better without having to do any work, which just means that you have to, to, if you get the prep in, if you get everything locked in the way it's supposed to be, it should just go like butter. Exactly. Anyway. And I, and I think that's the mother of all inve- innovation and invention and everything. Like, if you want, Yeah, exactly. If you want something done well and efficiently, find the laziest people in the world and ask them to take care of it. Because we'll figure it out. Totally. I will work my butt off one time. <laughs> So I never have to do it again. Leadership, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starfleet Leadership Academy. It's ongoing mission to develop leaders through Star Trek. To boldly go where no podcast has gone before. A leadership development podcast told through the lens of Star Trek. The Starfleet Leadership Academy, available everywhere you listen to podcasts.